uh, a concern to understand the idea of intuition, especially in its application to mathematics, uh, dates from very early in my career as a philosopher. Kant's philosophy of mathematics posed a challenge for two reasons. Uh, one, existing at all times since Kant's own, uh, is that of understanding his own conception of intuition and its role of ma in mathematics. The second is more specific to a time that includes uh, when I started out, namely the 1950s. Uh, that's the powerful influence exercised in the English-speaking world roughly from the publication of Principia Mathematica of the idea that Kant's philosophy of mathematics was in all respects superseded by later developments. The obvious ones consisting of non-Euclidean geometry and its application in physics, uh, but also the ant and the anti-Kantian gloss with which logicism was pre presented in particular by Russell. Early on, I persuaded myself by studying Brouwer and the Hilbert School that ideas of Kantian inspiration uh, weren't entirely dead. I wrote about that in the first essay in that book that someone kindly put on the table. Uh, uh, so in earlier writings, I developed a conception of mathematical intuition inspired distantly by Kant's, but more directly by ideas of Hilbert and Brouwer. Other conceptions of intuition, more connected with pre-Kantian rationalism, uh, have had some currency in more or less recent philosophy. And an instance is Gödel's conception, uh, which is the one that has most occupied me. And I'll use the term rational intuition for uh, conceptions of this general type. Uh, a fuller treatment of the subject should also take in distinctly post-Kantian conceptions, uh, especially that of Husserl. Uh, but I'm not going to comment on uh, historical conceptions other than Gödel's. So the first part of the paper will deal with the general idea of intuition and conceptions of rational intuition. And the second part will revisit uh, my own attempt to construct a rather limited uh, notion of mathematical intuition on the uh, model chiefly of Hilbert, but more distantly of Kant, and a little more in some respects also uh, Brouwer. Um, although how much it differs from Brouwer's uh, uh, mark can tell you quite a bit. Okay. A basic fact about the use of the word intuition and others translated by it is that even in philosophy it has uses that are not derived from Kant's Anschauung and only tangentially related to it. And most significant in philosophy are probably uses derived from the rationalist tradition, where roughly speaking, intuitive cognition represents a high form of rational cognition. Uh, in fact, the term intuition has been used in philosophy and in reflection on mathematics uh, in a rather disorderly way. Uh, one thing I uh, attempted to do in early, earlier writings is to bring some order into this use, uh, maybe without persuading anybody that uh, uh, to follow me in this respect. Uh, a starting point was the observation that it doesn't have a pedigree in ordinary usage that would allow us to arrive at a clear notion by analysis, as might be the case with the term knowledge and some others of wide philosophical currency. And it doesn't have the sort of 
origin as a philosophical term that's a natural reference point, like technical terms like analytic and synthetic. Uh, terms, terms translated as intuition go uh, far enough in the history of philosophy so that one shouldn't expect such a uh, reference point. Uh, and, well, my efforts to bring order were rather modest and focused on some particular problems to which notions of intuition had been applied, on the one hand by writers standing in a tradition going back to Kant, and on the other hand by Gödel, uh, who I think was originally inspired by the rationalist tradition, then reinforced by his late study of Husserl, but evidence has turned up uh, quite recently that uh, Russell's notion of acquaintance might have been an important source as well. A literature that I didn't comment on and had hardly attended to, uh, although uh, it was fairly extensive during the late stages of my work on this book, Mathematical Thought and Its Objects, is the considerable literature on the, the use of what are called intuitions in philosophy. Uh, some writers in this literature seem to proceed as if the term has the sort of pedigree that I denied it. And they proceed to analysis or argument about specific issues without saying even in a preliminary way what they're analyzing. Um, this is an off-the-cuff off and maybe improper statement, but if you want an example of how not to write an encyclopedia article, I suggest you look up the article on intuition in the otherwise excellent Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which um, <coughs> sort of jumps immediately with no preliminaries into this rather recent literature about <coughs> intuitions and analytic philosophy. Uh, I will say, though, about the contributors to this literature that their focus is entirely on propositional intuition, what I call intuition of that, uh, as opposed to intuition of objects, which is what one derives more directly from Kant. Uh, in spite of that focus uh, and the concentration on the role of intuition in the analytic philosophy of more or less recent times, uh, even the authors in this literature who do reflect on the concept of intuition differ considerably in how they understand the term. Uh, thus, in one article, Ernest Souza characterizes intuition in several different, though, related ways, but they're all species of belief. And we'll see in a moment that that, I think, is not his more considered view. But, uh, on the other hand, George Beeler, who's one of the more rationalist writers, uh, denies that having an intuition that P implies believing that P, uh, and in fact, he insists that some intuitions can behave like illusions in that it's possible for the illusion to persist uh, even if one doesn't have or no longer has the relevant belief. But other writers don't pursue this theme. Uh, furthermore, they don't generally don't adopt the terminology that uh, I recommended in this book that a mode of cognition should not be called intuition unless it's significantly analogous to perception. Uh, that uh, condition was satisfied by the conception of uh, what I call Hilbertian intuition that I developed in chapter five of this book. Uh, furthermore, such an analogy was claimed even rather strongly by Gödel uh, about his more purely rational conception of intuition. But looking at conceptions 
conceptions of intuition in a broader perspective, I now think it wouldn't be right to insist on it. Uh, for example, many of the writers I uh, just alluded to uh, uh, don't claim uh, such a strong analogy uh, of intuition with perception. Uh, so I'm not going to insist on such an analysis, uh, an analogy for a mode of cognition to be legitimately called intuition. Uh, this is, a, of course, a terminological matter. Uh, it's still a substantive issue whether intuition on one or another conception is in fact analogous to perception. Um, you can find a rather, a somewhat, a rather sympathetic treatment of Gödel's views, which rather firmly rejects this analogy in a very admirable paper by uh, Donald Martin, Gödel's conception of conceptual realism in uh, the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic, ten years back. Uh, <clears throat> however, this suggests uh, another issue that's worth remarking on. Must rational intuition be in some way founded on intuition or perception of objects? That would be an analogy with perceptual knowledge or belief, even if there isn't a stronger one. Uh, one reason why Gödel insisted on such an analogy is that he believed that intuition, now intuition that, essentially involved perception of concepts. Uh, I think he gives some, uh, some argument for that, but even sympathetic readers, for example, Martin, don't find that uh, term appropriate. Uh, but is this connection with uh, intuition of uh, objects essential to rational intuition? Uh, if so, such perception would have to be present in a case where a clear understanding of a statement uh, makes it clear that it's true or at least significantly plausible. But what is understood would be linguistic items uh, and perhaps reference to some entities that aren't close to concepts in Gödel's sense or even some other sense that context makes relevant to the truth of what the, uh, uh, the truth of the statement. Uh, well, let's suppose for the moment, as uh, many of these writers on intuitions in philosophy apparently do, that one can have a viable conception of intuition that, while paying virtually no attention to intuition of, intuition of objects, uh, if one doesn't require a significant analogy with perception, then the view that Gödel apparently held, that intuition that and of are inextricably intertwined, uh, may lose its force. At most, whether it obtains has to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, now I'm getting to point three on the handout. Uh, one of the most thoughtful discussions of the concept of intuition that I've found in the contemporary literature on intuitions is that of Ernest Sosa in his book, A Virtue Epistemology. His treatment has some convergence with what I've written about rational intuition, though it's clear that he comes at the problem from a quite different direction. His discussion of what he calls the perceptual model presents a clear view of how rational intuition would differ from perception. And to that extent, uh, it speaks against the idea that intuition of this kind should be significantly analogous to perception. Uh, Sosa's view is precisely that precisely because it is itself not subject to epistemic evaluation, perceptual experience 
can offer foundational justification, as he calls it, for claims based on it. Uh, this would be contested probably by, for example, writers who follow Donald Dav Davidson. Uh, what might play this role in rational intuition, whether or not it's in, in the end correct, would be uh, intellectual seemings, that's a term that Sosa uses. Uh, he seems to admit that a similar seeming is present in perceptual judgment. I think that's rather standard. If I see a table in front of me, I have a strong inclination uh, maybe in the present situation, irresistible inclination uh, to judge that there is a table in front of me. Uh, Sosa's view, which <coughs> strikes me as correct, uh, seems to be that that's different from my merely having the visual experience as of uh, a table in front of me, which I might have if I had substantial reason to doubt that there really is. Now, take the case of my seeing, in quotation marks, that 3 plus 2 is equal to 5. Uh, the element of intellectual seeming is undoubtedly there. When I reflect on this proposition, it seems evident to me. In the axiomatic development of arithmetic, we give a proof, but Sosa's probably right in assuming that its evident character doesn't depend on the sort of proof that's available, which perhaps only logicians and possibly philosophers are interested in. Even they probably regard the proof as serving the purpose more of showing that it follows from the De Kint Peano or other axioms than of convincing us that it's true. Uh, it seems that the statement acquires its evident character simply from reflecting on it, that is, on what the sentence means. Uh, that would be a sense, perhaps, in which it could be said to be self-evident. Um, reflecting on research on the foundations of arithmetic would suggest that there are different ways of understanding what 3 plus 2 equals 5 means. Is it a statement about cardinality, as Frege's development of arithmetic would suggest? Or, and as much psychological research on the conception of number in young children seems to presuppose, or should we simply unpack the statement in terms of zero or one and successor, as is suggested by the standard development of first order arithmetic? Uh, pictures that we might form to convince ourselves that it's true might naturally lend themselves to one or the other reading, or they might preserve the ambiguity. Uh, this sort of observation takes us away from Sosa's main point. That is that visual experience can be what he calls a basis for a perceptual judgment uh, because it's beyond justification or unjustification. In other words, visual experience is not, so to speak, either justified or failed to be justified, or even more or less justified, it just is. Uh, and what's justified are judgments one might make on the basis of it. Intellectual seemings, on the other hand, are too close to the judgments. That's the uh, quotation A on the handout. Uh, we have found intuitions to be best understood as intellectual seemings or attractions, and these, unlike visible visual experiences, are not factors that attract us uh, uh, to assent. They are rather the attractions themselves. Uh, uh, in a termini terminology I've used, intuition, according to Sosa, is apparent intrinsic plausibility. 
It's intrinsic because the attraction he mentions is exerted by entertaining the proposition. Uh, but clearly it falls short of belief, although it doesn't involve a possibly strong inclination toward belief. So that's where his uh, this view differs from what he expressed in the other paper of his that I alluded to. Uh, that makes it more in agreement with the uses of others in our own time, including, I would maintain, Gödel. When they consider logic and mathematics, writers on intuition coming from general epistemology seem to confine themselves to the most elementary examples. 3 plus 2 equals 5 is a popular one, maybe because it occurs in Descartes' med meditations. Uh, and I haven't found in his writings a less elementary one, but he's written a lot, so I could be wrong <laughs> that there isn't one in thinking there isn't one there. In other domains, they do consider more complicated cases of a place where something that can be called intuition seems necessary is counterexamples, uh, which have been used in philosophy ever since the dialogues of Plato. Uh, many of the counterexamples from such classics are less subject to challenge uh, than many other intuitions applied in philosophy, no doubt because of their relatively concrete character. Uh, they don't necessarily make worries about their objectivity go away. I think counterexamples in contemporary philosophy are challenged much more. Maybe we're too uh, deferential toward the greats of the past. Uh, well, later I'm going to consider the application to more complex mathematical cases. Um, I'll just remark that the, the case 3 plus 2 equals 5 strikes me as already differing significantly from Kant's famous example, 7 plus 5 equals 12. Uh, Kant, I think, would have denied that simply by turning over that proposition in one's mind and trying to understand it as clearly as possible, one would see that it's true. And what he gives in his famous uh, argument in the introduction to the second edition of the critique is a procedure. Uh, and I think the procedure could even be regarded as a kind of proof, although it's quite clear that Kant didn't think of it that way. Uh, in general, the questions about objectivity that arise uh, concern whether uh, the intellectual seemings that are, that are, are at issue are genuinely rational or rather re result from some subtle indoctrination, probably of a specific culture that's very common in discussions of moral questions or perhaps factors of a quite different nature. Uh, but that sort of question isn't very persuasive in the case of as basic a mathematical statement as 3 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, one reason is presumably that it's part of a much larger pra practice of arithmetical calculation. Uh, going back to the Babylonians even. And then of number theory and algebra where there's been agreement in results across a very wide range of cultures. Uh, Sosa characterizes a belief as apt if it's true by virtue of a competence of the agent. Uh, replacing truth by some other criterion of success, this characterization applies to other performances involving skill. Uh, you find that in his writings on epistemology, but we needn't be concerned with that. Apt belief is the first stage toward knowledge. 
uh, and he calls that animal knowledge. Uh, after some training, the school child presumably possesses animal knowledge of 3 plus 2 equals 5 and some other basic arithmetical identities. Uh, since the results of proof, even in elementary mathematics, can satisfy this criterion, such knowledge isn't necessarily intuitive. Uh, I would presume, though, that for Sosa, an intuition that results in belief that is apt counts as intuitive knowledge. I think he, I haven't, don't recall his using that term. But, uh, the criterion is not obviously of help if we want to determine if an intuition does count as knowledge. Uh, in application to mathematics, there's a risk that it will make mathematical knowledge depend on psychology. Uh, suppose I have a firm intuition to the effect that the axiom of choice is true. Uh, if I test this by asking if this manifests my mathematical competence, the t test seems on the face of it to be a psychological one. However, appearances might be misleading. Careful reflection on the meaning of the axiom, on applications that have been made of it, on con consequences in the domain I'm explicitly concerned with and others that I know about from other domains of mathematics, are the activities I would engage in to determine if my mathematical competence is manifested by my accepting the axioms. These activities consist largely of mathematical and logical reflection. The case is analogous to the often cited one that if I am asked whether I believe that P for some proposition, the main part of the activity leading to an answer is for me simply to think about the question whether P, whether it's true. Uh, a tempting conclusion to draw from this example, though, is that the axiom is not evident by itself, by rational intuition, but becomes so by being embedded in a theory. Uh, not just set theory uh, by itself, but also other domains of mathematics where it's applied. For example, with the axiom of choice, we can prove that every vector space has a basis, uh, and that there exist sets of real numbers that are not Lebesgue measurable. Uh, I don't think that tells against the very idea that such intuition has ep uh, epistemic force, uh, but it does indicate, I think, that the intrinsic plausibility of a principle like the axiom of choice is greatly reinforced by its application, um, maybe even more by ones that are important for our understanding of the universe of sets, such as the consequence that cardinals are comparable. Uh, one can infer that when Semelo introduced it in 1904, the axiom didn't possess the degree of evidence it has today. Uh, That may be an oversimplified way of describing the situation, but it seems to me that it's largely borne, borne out by uh, considering the history of the axiom and its application uh, in mathematics. Um, well, a large question remains. So turn got to now to uh, part, uh, point four. To what extent are axioms of mathematics known by a rational intuition? It would be plausible to give an affirmative answer for some principles of arithmetic, such as that every natural number has a successor, uh, and some version of mathematical induction or primitive recursion. Unproblematic axioms in set theory, such as the axiom of pairing, uh, would be candidates. Uh, I've argued the contrary for the cases of the axiom of power set and the axiom scheme of replacement in set theory. Uh, that view might not find wide assent, 
uh, but it would be, wide, would be widely agreed that for stronger axioms of infinity, more direct insight runs out. They have to be justified by the theory that results from them uh, in a manner first memorably described by Gödel or simply taken as hypotheses. Uh, well, I'm going to go a little further into the question about the arith arithmetic of natural numbers as based on the data compaiana axioms. Uh, there is a question about the formulation of induction. The question might be different whether we consider the first order schema, the second order axiom, or the open-ended understanding which leaves open what predicates might be allowed in instances of induction. Uh, uh, in the con uh, constructivists have questioned even the first order version in the context of classical logic. Uh, apart from that, we have to consider that first order arithmetic formalizes a mathematical practice uh, accumulating uh, over a time from long before first order logic as such was thought about. Uh, Furthermore, although some version of induction expresses a central aspect of our understanding of the concept of natural number, uh, by itself it doesn't assure, ensure that the concept is, in the understanding that is, that the concept is consistent or coherent. That makes it doubtful that rational intuition alone is sufficient to make all axioms of first order arithmetic evident. Gödel appears to be a maximalist about the epistemic force of rational intuition in mathematics. However, he held that intuition rests on what he calls perception of concepts, and that concepts can be perceived more or less clearly. Uh, in discussion of intuition in his published writings, he generally has the axioms of set theory in view. Uh, Rational intuition concerning axioms involves perception of the concepts referred to them, to in them, in particular that of uh, the universe of sets. As Martin points out, it, it's often that when he has in, that he has in mind when he talks about more briefly about the concept of set. Uh, uh, that clearly involves some elaboration of the concept in effect of the iterative conception of set. Uh, and that do, uh, does something to offer an approach to the more, com more complicated cases than those found in the general epistemological literature. How even, however, even for what seemed to be implied by the concept, a question still arises which Gödel puts as that, I think a little misleadingly, as that of the existence of the concept. Um, however, I don't want to pursue these issues further. I've discussed Google's conceptions of intuition elsewhere, and also more recently the related one of, uh, of analyticity. Uh, uh, but I think he does add a lot to a simple picture of rational intuition uh, to say something substantial, even if it's not uh, totally convincing of how, uh, what intuition of the axioms of set theory uh, is supposed to be. The connection with analyticity certainly indicates that something like conceptual analysis uh, has to be part of the process of generating such intuition. Uh, uh, I'm going to take up one more issue. I'll return to the case of uh, uh, intuition, uh, of arithmetic. Uh, let's assume that we accept a, a certain system of axioms, say for arithmetic, on the basis of intuition. 
According to Gödel, that would mean that we perceive the concept of natural number and the more specific concepts of arithmetic with sufficient clarity to see the truth of the axioms. For the sake of argument, I will assume that the clarity really is sufficient. But now, how have we come by that clarity? It's hard to imagine that someone who was just presented with the axioms would have any real understanding of what they're about, even if he, he had been exposed by the arithmetic that's taught in sco school and was told that their axioms are arithmetic. Of course, the matter is different for someone who has more serious mathematical training. Uh, but even such a person would have to have come to, would have come to understand the proofs of results uh, that, at least in a somewhat regimented form, would be derived from the axioms. This will be true even if he hasn't studied number theory per se. That is what's taught in a university course in number theory. I don't see how Gödel can escape the conclusion uh, that this person has a clearer perception of the concepts involved in the axioms than someone who has just been pre presented with the axioms and has perhaps spent some time meditating on their content. In more neutral language, he understands the concepts of arithmetic better than he did at the beginning of his mathematical training. <coughs> it follows, I think, that from Gödel's own point of view, the evidence of rational intuition can be reinforced by knowledge of the theory that can be developed from principles about which we have a certain intuition uh, my, one might still say that the axioms are known by intuition, but the intuition itself has obtained the necessary strength uh, through developing the consequences of the intuitive principles. On this reading, Gödel would be obliged to deny that the axioms of arithmetic are known by rational intuition alone, but he could still say that in the end they are known by rational intuition. Uh, well, now I'm going to turn to uh, uh, the other part of my own reflection on intuition. Uh, in contrast to the notion of rational intuition, and so this is point five on the handout, uh, that is the focus of the previous section, uh, the conception of intuition that's been salient in my earlier writing is broadly speaking Kantian. That it has a spatio-temporal character and will therefore be more restricted in the subject matter to which it might apply uh, well, that, no, it does have a spatio-temporal character, and so it will be more restricted in the subject matter to which it might reply, apply than the rational intuition I've been talking about so far. In systematic writings, particularly this book, uh, I didn't claim that the conception of intuition with which I work was actually counts. Furthermore, I don't propose to revisit here the question how Kant himself understood and used his own term, unshallowed. Not only do I not have anything new to say about it, uh, it would distract from the systematic aim of my writing on intuition in relation to arithmetic. Uh, in view of the fact that the conception of intuition that's developed in chapter, uh, first of all, chapter five of Mathematical Thought and its Objects owed its primary into inspiration to Hilbert, but also some to Brouwer, both of whom invoke Kant in relevant places in their writings. My conception can claim to be a distant descendant of Kant's, but I don't see any reason to claim more than that. Uh, uh, 
the idea I started with from was that the individu individuation of objects of perception doesn't have to be a, according to a trajectory in space and time. It can rest on what, at least in this, many of the simplest cases, would be called sameness of form, which can be instantiated at discontinuous and possibly quite distant places and times. But in such cases of which shapes and linguistic objects are the most natural, the objects are by the usual criteria abstract. Uh, first of all, they don't have uh, a definite, uh, definite location. Uh, and I don't think it's natural to uh, think of them as entering into causal relations. Um, uh, uh, an example that I offer uh, is that that of someone, A, uttering words in such a way as to anger another person, B. It's natural to say that it's not the words themselves that cause B's anger, but A's utterance, but that's an event in time. Um, a good kind of case to think of is an ethnic slur, and suppose that is what A uttered, uh, could one say that the slur itself caused B's anger? Uh, I don't think so. I think it was A's utterance of it that uh, <coughs> caused it. One might imagine that B is a theorist who thinks about ethnic slurs. So they're in his consciousness all the time, but then A comes along and applies it to him. Uh, well, the general idea that there's some, something like perception of some kinds of quasi-concrete objects that count by uh, the criterion I've been using as abstract hasn't given rise to serious controversy. By a quasi-concrete object, I mean one that has a more or less intrinsic representation in uh, the realm of the concrete as a, a linguistic type is typically uh, represented by physical tokens. I said this, uh, this, the idea that there's something like perception in many of these cases hasn't given rise to serious controversy Although it is incompatible with the strict nominalism you'll find in some philosophers who reject abstract objects of any kind. Um, uh, but there were two further steps in the conception of mathematical intuition that I developed taking Hilbert as my primary model. Um, So, uh, uh, the, I had something like linguistic types and Similar strings was singled out much earlier by Hilbert and Bernays. Uh, in their view, they could be treated as potentially infinite. Seems to me they sometimes hedge about this, but I don't see how they uh, could not treat them in that way. Uh, so given any such string, one obtains a new one by adding a symbol at its right end. And it seems that 
in the relevant sense of in principle, this can always in principle be done so that there's no limit to the number of terms in a string. So I maintain that one can see intuitively that any such string can be extended. Uh, let's assume for the moment that this conclusion is correct. Uh, one can see its importance by contrasting it with another case, namely finite sets. Uh, uh, in the book, there's some exploration of the idea of intuition of finite sets, uh, and I think such an idea appears already in Husserl's philosophy of arithmetic. Uh, this is a little more distant from normal perception uh, than perception of linguistic types is. Uh, uh, let's consider a very simple case one sees a very s small number of well-distinguished objects, let's say chairs set against a wall. Uh, to take in a set, there has to be something more than perception of the chairs. Uh, there would have to be a sort, a sort of synthesis that takes them as a single object, but in such a way that the individual objects retain their identity, so that in particular one has a set, with definite elements, uh, rather than a muriological sum that at least theoretically could be chopped up um, uh, any old way. Uh, uh, well, the strings are types, and the existence of longer strings uh, doesn't depend on the existence of larger physical tokens of them, uh, longer ones. Now consider sets of chairs. Of course, if one is conscious of a set of chairs in the way I described, one can imagine one more chair to be added to the set to give rise to another set of chairs with one more element. But what's needed for the existence of a set containing one more chair uh, is not imagining an additional chair, but the actual existence of one. Uh, and for intuition of such a set parallel to intuition of strings, on my model or that of Hilbert and Bernice, uh, the chair would have to be perceived. Uh, so a set of n chairs can exist only if at least n chairs exist. If one aims to witness infinity by larger and larger finite sets, uh, one will either have, have to have infinitely many ground level objects to work with, or one will have to ascend in rank as one does in the theory of hereditarily finite sets. Uh, uh, well, in uh, section 35 of uh, that book, I concluded that the ascent in rank involved in the theory of hereditarily finite sets uh, posed insuperable difficulties for the idea that there's intuition of, intuition of such sets, even if one started with as perceptible and ob ob objects to start with as chairs. Uh, I concluded that one cannot see intuitively that any set can be enlarged by an additional element unless one has mathematical objects from some other source. However, this difficulty doesn't arise in the same form if we change our focus from sets to sequences. Uh, the set consisting of, say, A1 to An plus 1 differs from the set of A1 to An uh, only if An plus 1 differs from all the elements that have come before. But the sequence, A1, then A2, and so on, and finally An plus 1, 
uh, is a new object, even if the new term, a n plus 1, is identical to one of the earlier terms. Uh, Hilbert and Bernays seem to have viewed their strings simply as bounded configurations of in space. And my conception of Hilbertian intuition followed them in this. Many readers might find it more natural to think of the strings as sequences. Uh, but for the moment, I want to consider sequences of garden variety but well distinguished objects. Uh, such as uh, chairs in my discussion of sets. Uh, in another respect, consciousness of sequences resembles consciousness of sets rather than that of strings as spatial configurations in that it seems to involve the same sort of synthesis as we discerned in, in consciousness of sets perhaps more complex because each term in a sequence has its intrinsic place in the sequence. A permutation of the elements of a set yields the same set, but a permutation other than the identity of the terms of a sequence, uh, is there water there? Yes. Uh, typically yields a different sequence. Uh, For this reason, my conception of Hilbertian, if my conception is modified so that the strings are thought of as, oh, it's got late, hasn't it? And I haven't even got to the punch, the punch line. Well, well, I think we have, we have plenty of time. You have to allow me to uh, uh, go over normal time. Uh, uh, if my conception is modified so that we think of the strings as sequences, the phenomenological argument that I gave to the effect that every string can be extended doesn't work quite as it was supposed to in that work. Uh, I claimed that it didn't depend on the knowledge that a string had been generated by success, successive appendings of an individual stroke and wasn't an inductive conclusion. Uh, but if we add an additional term to a sequence, the original sequence doesn't play a role that could have been played by any bounded spatial configuration. Uh, uh, below, we might think of the species sequence is spatial, that's not obviously essential. Well, the conception of strings as spatial configurations led to a sharp criticism that was levied by Felix Mürhützer uh, in a review article on mathematical thought and its objects published in uh, the journal Erkenntnis five years back. Uh, he seems to agree with my claim that there is something like a perception of such objects as strings. He even seems prepared to talk of perception quite literally in this case. Uh, his dissent concerns the claim that these objects are mathematical objects uh, and can make up uh, and what I called an intuitive model of arithmetic. Probably the strongest objection concerns an issue that uh, I myself raised. In order to be mathematical objects, strings as types have to be sharply defined. But the relation of tokens being of the same type uh, is bound to be vague. For example, we can easily imagine a sequence of so-called strings that differ from each other very slightly uh, with the result that the first differs from the last enough so that it's not obvious at all that they're of the same type. But if you go from one to the next, it, it's maybe natural to say that they are. Uh, that's expressed by the picture at the bottom of the first page of the 
uh, handout, although that's maybe oversimplified uh, to really make the point in a convincing way. One would have to have a much longer list. To, um, Well, uh, what Mürmürzer questions is the claim that this vagueness about sameness of type as applied to tokens need not lead to vagueness about identity of the types themselves. Uh, uh, he finds uh, unconvincing the suggestion I made uh, bri briefly, that is, that the potential vagueness of identity of types uh, can be, uh, as I put it, shunted off to vagueness about the identity of tokens and the relation of token little a is of type big A. Uh, so, uh, take consider, say, the first and the last on the list on the handout. Or maybe the better, perhaps, the first and the third. So the first one is clearly a, a, a string of four strokes. The third is maybe a borderline case. Uh, uh, so my idea of what was, yes, of course it's a vague question whether these inscriptions are tokens of the same type, but uh, it doesn't follow that identity of types is itself vague. Uh, Nilhutz are conceded that he sees them as types, uh, but then finds it vague whether the second is of the same type, and he argued that uh, the vagueness has to do with the types themselves. Um, um, I don't think this is helped by uh, a general uh, claim I made about this sort of intuition is that one would bring to uh, one's perception the uh, relevant concept that determines the type types. Um, Uh, his argument is that the concept itself is vague. Um, well, if you think of other cases like thinking about a number, numbers are certainly sharply defined. Uh, I think one can cook up cases about uh, of the question whether whether one is thinking of a definite number. And imagine the situation where one gradually wakes up and tries to waken oneself up by thinking of numbers. Maybe if you start, you're not really thinking of a number at all, uh, but after a while you are, and where exactly do you get there? Uh, let me skip that. Uh, Uh, anyway, it seems that I'm caught between two uncomfortable positions. Uh, suppose I view these objects, contrary to what I did in the book, as sequences, then my argument that one can sue and see intuitively that every string can be extended doesn't work as, as it was intended. Uh, but uh, if I stick to my original intent and view them as spatial configurations, uh, then I seem unable to avoid the objection that the relevant concept of type is vague. Well, in spite of this difficulty, I'm going to explore the possibility of taking something like this to be sequences. 
uh, in order to avoid an issue about vagueness of the co in the concept of a single stroke, we can consider sequences of a single object, which we can consider to be uh, clearly distinguished. Uh, let it be the library stool in my study. Um, there's no object anywhere near that resembles it uh, uh, very uh, at all closely. So we can begin with a sequence consisting of the stool. Then we have a pair, each of whose terms is the stool, a triple, each of whose terms is the stool, and so on. Or we could vary the diet by having two objects or three objects that, that will have to be indefinitely, indefin indefinitely repeated. Uh, well, here I'm following the, what in the book I call the sequences as tuples uh, uh, conception. So uh, you get longer and longer sequences by uh, continuing the process of forming uh, tuples where each instance of that involves maybe nothing bigger than a pair, or at least some small bounded uh, number of terms. Uh, so we do arrive at a potentially infinite sequence, uh, and we don't have the difficulty that arose in the case of sets of needing a new actual object every time. Uh, However, what's iterated is the process of forming, let's say, a pair of two given objects, one the sequence so far, and the other, let's say, the library stool. But then there's something analogous to the ascent in rank that caused trouble about hereditarily finite sets. Uh, so, say a sequence of four objects formed in this way. Uh, will look like this. So you get, uh, particularly if it gets large, you get a piling up of brackets. Uh, now, are the brackets intuitive or not? Uh, it's they who impose that impose the order of the objects and uh, distinguish what we're talking about from a set of the same objects. Uh, if we give a negative answer, has intuition really given us the sequence as such? Uh, on the other hand, uh, a positive answer opens the door to issues about vagueness like those raised by Newhood. So, uh, it would seem that the alternative sequence is, as functions conception isn't of any help uh, because it presupposes that we already have a, pot a potential inf infinity of what I call numbers, of counters. If you already have numbers, they, they typically serve as counters, as marking the place uh, in a sequence. Uh, at this point, I suggest that we take a cue from Brouwer and introduce time and our consciousness of its passage. I should have put on the handout of uh, one of his descriptions, uh, but I can read one. Intuitionist mathematics is, essentially a, is an essentially languageless activity of the mind having its origin in the perception of a move of time, that is, the follow, falling apart of a life moment into two distinct things, one of which gives way to the other, but is retained by memory. If the tuity thus born is divested of all quality, there remains the empty form of the common substratum of all tuities. It's this common substratum, the empty form, which is the basic intuition of mathematics. That's from Brouwer's South African paper, but uh, 
there are many other similar formulations. Uh, well, Brouwer's idea seems to provide a sequence of moments in which the present is separated in, from the past. Uh, and that seems to be able to do the work that we were asking for counters to do. Well, our intuition of the structure of time has it that there's always a further moment, even though our individual temporal experience will end at some point. Uh, if we do demand a, v a correlation of each moment that's singled out with an external object, we don't need an, inf an infinity of such objects, since, as I uh, noted before, objects can be repeated. It seems evident that this process can, in the sort of mathematical way in which can, the word can is used, can be iterated indefinitely. Uh, but a response is needed at this point to an obvious question uh, whether this modification of the ideas about intuition uh, can meet the Mülhutz or objection about vagueness. We naturally think of the flow of time in, even in our subjective experience as continuous. And of course Brouwer himself makes use of that idea in claiming that the original intuition of mathematics also offers a basis for the idea of the continuum and therefore of intuitionistic analysis. Uh, but I'll assume that the perception of a move of time is something conscious and explicit. And since it will take at least a minimum amount of time, successive such perceptions will be discrete. Uh, even though they are sort of lifted out of a continuous time. Uh, I, we could repeat Mülhoetzer's scenario in the present time, uh, setting. Uh, for each n up to a certain point, say 10, let's suppose that the subject notes the division of uh, present and past, then waits n seconds, then notes the division uh, with one se second intervals, let's say five more times. Uh, it might seem uh, natural that to read the case where n equals 10 uh, is uh, as one in which there's such a division followed 10 seconds later by a sequence of five divisions. Uh, if n equals one, it seems clear that we have a sequence of six divisions. But at some intermediate point, if not n equal five, then maybe n equal three or four, it may not be clear uh, what to say. Uh, I didn't raise such a difficulty in talking about consciousness of finite sets. Uh, Uh, but uh, I did introduce this idea of synthesis, taking the objects as a unity while retaining their individuation. In the case now at hand, we can introduce the same idea. The question whether we have one sequence of divisions of present and past or two uh, is settled by our acts of synthesis. In the above situation, even in the case of n equal 10, we can unify the outlying moment with the latter ones, but whether we do so depends on us. Could we have done the same in the case of the strings of my book? In principle, yes, but that would have introduced a temporal element that contradicts the claim that the strings are spatial configurations. Uh, well, the crucial question is whether this conception avoids the vagueness objection pressed by Mühlitzer. I think the only place where it could arise is in the notion of synthesis. What the synthesis is supposed to lead, yield is consciousness of a sequence 
uh, or if we allow that term, intuition of a sequence, in an actual case, can it happen? We have a borderline situation as to whether this synthesis has been effective. Uh, 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 I'm not very sure about that, but uh, I, I think it can be argued that vagueness in the concept of synthesis, it, uh, it does exist. Uh, leads not to vagueness in the concept of set or sequence, but vagueness in the concept of intuiting such an object. Uh, uh, um, now, how about the argument to the effect that a string of the sort that I discussed earlier can be extended by one more. The case seems simpler that in the present context where I can rely on the intuition of time. Uh, uh, and I think it, particularly if we uh, follow uh, a version of my argument that I uh, a kind of development of my argument in a paper recently published by Robin Jeshion, I think we can uh, apply that argument to this situation. Well, I haven't really come to a firm <coughs> view about the next step in such, in such a development, which would be uh, to decide whether what I earlier said about addition and multiplication can be defended, and if not, what the consequences of that will be. But I've gone on far too long, and we'll have to stop. Anyway. Yes, Mark. Just a question for, for reference. Uh, at the end, you mentioned a paper by Robin Booth. Robin Jeshion? Yes, sure. Uh, How does it spell? Uh, I'll write the name down. Intuiting the Infinite, and it's in Philosophical Studies last year. I think it's volume 171. <clears throat> it's a more thorough exploration of that question than I undertook myself. Although she starts out from an interpretative premise, which I think isn't correct, namely that I developed these ideas to deal with uh, the problem posed by Benassarath and mathematical truth. But I don't think that plays a role in the details of her arguments. Respect to the problem that you lay out, the intuition of a finite set, it seems there's two moments. There's the intuition of the multiplicity or the multitude of the discrete elements composing the set. And then there's the intuition of their unity. Is that fair to say how you're laying that? The letter you were going to synthesis? That's what I call synthesis, yeah. Yeah. Is there an intuitive issue of 
the apprehending of both together, or the intuiting of both together, namely the unity and the multiplicity. So it seems to natural reason they're sort of opposed, if not contradictory, and yet. Uh, well, there's certain, it's certainly not contradictory because if there's more than one object involved, which would be the typical case, uh, uh, logic already tells us that they can't be identical. Um, so it's, I think it would be a question whether uh, the human mind is capable of uh, uh, carrying out a uh, synthesis in which the uh, individuality of the objects uh, in, that are the elements of the set uh, uh, is maintained. Uh, there's no doubt at all that we can do this on an intellectual level. If we couldn't, there'd be no such thing as set theory, not even the basics of set theory. Uh, the question is whether we can do this, so to speak, only one small step above, above ordinary perception. Uh, Uh, well, I, if you don't find it very plausible, I, I really don't know what would persuade you that it is. Uh, there are obviously limits. Uh, uh, I even, uh, you know, I think believe Husserl claimed that one, there was some very small limit to uh, the numbers. Uh, that what uh, that one really has a uh, the, the kind of basic uh, cognition that uh, and I can't uh, according to the standard that uh, was suggested by what I've said uh, intuit the set consisting of the people in this room, although it's not a very large number by uh, compared to the population of Paris, it's tiny. Uh, um, but I, I don't feel any difficulty about uh, very small numbers, like three or four. Uh, the que there would be a question, could one attain such intuition by going over a number of objects one by one over a period of time? Uh, I think you'd have to keep track in some way, uh, for example, by counting, uh, and whether that, I guess my intuition is that before very long uh, you get out of the sphere of intuition. It's, uh, 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 but uh, I think others might d develop these ideas with, with different consequences. If we grant that we're dealing with maybe two or three objects, which most of all, according to the installed uh, research in the time setting, you could intuit uh, eigenlich, you know, authentically. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a, an additional problem, not to criticize what you're saying, namely, you've got the intuition of the discrete items, each of which is one, right, altogether or more than one, and then you've got the unity or the collective unity of those items. And it seems to me it, implicit what you're saying, you've got two moments of intuition that aren't identical. Mm -hmm. So the logical way out may not work because you've got two different kinds of unity. You've got the unity 
discrete manifold of units, and then you have the collective unity. Yeah, but doesn't doesn't something like that? Uh, 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 well, Kant would have said that unifying manifolds is involved in all perception. Uh, if you even if you don't go go that far, for example, uh, the gentleman directly in front of me has a. Uh, a jacket with a color that sort of strikes me. Uh, and I can simultaneously, I think, perceive the, the jacket, but, so to speak, perceive also the man who's wearing the jacket. So there's a kind of unity there. It's quite different from what I was talking about, but... Uh, It, it still involves uh, it's two different things. Um, and in some sense, in that case, I think it's just implicit in ordinary perception. I might, so to speak, give my attention to uh, uh, to the jacket. Um, I think the set case I think is more artificial. Uh, that I think maybe is shown by history, the difficulty of clearly distinguishing between sets and muriological sums and uh, possibly other kinds of objects that, uh, uh, that could be relevant. Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the notion of uh, intuition that uh, there is a understanding question of a proposition of being true. And uh, I was wondering what is exactly the theoretical utility of the role of such a notion when, uh, when we have a, what I see equivalent notions such as simply understanding or intuition that uh, that uh, proposition P is true, it seems to me, at least in the mathematical case, you just uh, understanding the proposition. Well, so, uh, suppose I'd never heard of gold box conjecture, uh, and someone stated it to me. Uh, it doesn't really take much mathematical knowledge at all to understand Goldbach's conjecture in the sense of, so to speak, knowing pretty clearly what the conjecture says. Uh, but that doesn't get one anywhere toward uh, determining whether it's true. Yeah. So I think there has to be a... Uh, a considerable difference between simply understanding a proposition and uh, having insight to its truth. Now, the easiest case of what I call rational intuition uh, would be one where understanding uh, is enough to have insight into its truth, but uh, nothing of any complexity in mathematics would would satisfy that condition. Maybe three plus two equals five does, but uh, I was in effect suggesting that already seven plus five equals 12 doesn't satisfy it. Yes? Perhaps a naive question. It's uh, only the notion of time use it perhaps broader. So uh, uh, you, you need something, uh, you need the continuity of time, and it seems you need the kind of homogeneity of time. Uh, but 
very intuitive notion of time we have, this, this direct uh, idea we have of time, which is not physical time measured with a clock, I don't know, it seems doesn't give us that. So um, we don't, we cannot, apparently at least, immediately uh, have this, uh, a measure of time in the intuitive sense. So I, I'm not sure which notion is this. That's immediate, immediate. Yeah. I Yeah, now, being able to measure time, of course, I think involves making a connection of the passage of time with uh, physical processes. That's how, how all clocks work, even, uh, even the most simple ones. Uh, uh, now, I'm not in a position to argue that uh, what's involved in what I was talking about uh, doesn't have some kind of dependence on physical processes at all. That would be... Uh, but uh, at least on the face of it, it doesn't seem to involve explicitly attending to or developing theories about physical processes. Maybe I can be shown to be wrong about that, but um, so. You, know, you talked about the homogeneity of time. Uh, I think probably Kant's conception of pure intuition, at least in the case of space, and space, and I don't see any reason to doubt that it would also be true of the uh, case of time, uh, did somehow carry homogeneity with it. Uh, to what extent that's true, Brouwer's conception, Mark would be much better, in a much better position to speak than I would be. Uh, um, uh, but I, I do somewhat doubt that uh, but that's required for what I was trying to do, but I could be shown to be wrong. <laughs> May I ask? Yeah. Uh, so in, in Brower's case, he, the way he sees it, he's explicit that uh, he thinks of it as a, as a, the, the primitive intuition of time, as a time without a measure, without a skill. And the, the, uh, so you can put a skill on that continuum, but but that's a, a voluntary act of applying mathematics, so to speak. But the, to get this idea going of, uh, well, Charles read the quote of uh, unfolding tuities and so on, that, that would not require a scale of the continuum. Have a, a question of understanding what, why, what you really want to make with the distinction between the case where three plus two equals five and the case of five plus seven plus twelve. Um, is that related to the? Yeah. How is that related? If it is related to the link that you want to have between perception and intuition. You, you want to say that there is a conceptual tie or building connection. Huh? You, you want to say that there is some conceptual tie or built-in link, as it were, between perception and intuition. Well, in general, I didn't... Not that they're the same thing, but you want to say... In general, I didn't want to say that. I, I did... I think... Um, uh, the 
kind of conception of intuition sort of distantly related to Kant, mm -hmm. I, I would say there is such a connection. Uh, how does that emerge in the case of 7 plus 5 equals 12? Uh, in uh, Kant's treatment of it, mm -hmm. uh, he says, to get start with seven and seven to five, I have to choose some instance. He says, either the fingers on, of my hand or, or five points. Now, if the, if, you're, if the fingers of his hand are, are the relevant instance, then perception is right there. Five points is somewhat more uh, abstract, it comes from, from geometry, and I think he'd probably be invoking his theory of spatial intuition. Um, uh, if you had a completely non-perceptual con uh, consciousness of points, then uh, maybe that would be a way away from uh, connecting uh, intuition on a more, more or less Kantian model uh, with perception. Uh, uh, but I don't, I, I think that was rather far from, such a conception was rather far from Kant's mind when he sure. developed that example. But you want to say that in both cases you have a perception of objects than in certain relations, or direct perception of objects than in relations. Both in the case of three plus two equals five, and in Kant's case. Yeah. Well, in the case of three plus two equals five, I was at least willing to grant, uh, for the sake of argument, that you didn't need to go through procedure like Kant's to see that it's true. Uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced by that, but uh, it, uh, it has been used an as an example by philosophers who don't seem to envisage such a procedure. So, Because you may want to say that there is a distinction between there's no distinction with respect to perception of objects, but there is a distinction with respect to perception or intuition that a proposition holds or is true if you get very large numbers. And so on. Now that brings in the right. whole other question of the epistemic force right. Of, right. of intuition. Uh, and um, I think even the writers that I was talking about had in mind in the first part of the paper where the only explicit examples were Sosa and Good, uh, uh, don't regard intuition as, so to speak, giving a guarantee of truth. You might imagine using the word intuition uh, so to speak, the way we typically use the word no. Uh, that is, if it's not true, you didn't know it. Likewise, uh, if the axiom, uh, if some set theory, the set theoretic axiom that Google uh, would say he has intuition of, if it, you could have the usage that if it turns out to lead to a contradiction, then what you thought was an intuition wasn't really an intuition. But that isn't the way either of them uses the word. Uh, I think Descartes uh, did use the word that way, although almost certainly people in this room know more about Descartes than I do. There, there are these remarks by Gödel quoted in Logical Journey, where he says, well, if you drive for absolute certainty, nothing remains. Where you're speaking of only very small integers. Now, I don't recall enough of the non text, but that would be worth looking at. Mm. Your 
national configurations and your strings of objects. I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question about the strings uh, of uh, the spatial configurations which you mentioned in your example. Yeah. Because um, that reminded me of uh, a task that Piaget was given to children, which is the conservation task, uh, in order to understand if they uh, got uh, arithmetic, the basic uh, concepts of arithmetic by counting. Basically, it was given to the, ch to the children uh, like small disks, and then it was spreading them out and asking the children if uh, they were the same number or not. Mm. And basically, what Piaget is saying is that it is only when they have developed something like the notion of one-to-one -one correspondences that they are able to 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 respond correctly, to reply correctly, and say that in fact, even if the objects have been spread out, they are still uh, in the same number. And so, thinking about this case in Piaget, I was thinking, I was, I wanted to ask why, in your case, we can just think of this string of spatial configurations uh, to be the same uh, once we can find the, and show that there is one to one correspondences between the spatial elements of each sequences and uh, why that would, that would not be enough to, to explain why they are the same even if, uh, even if they have a long list and one of it is uh, spread out. Yeah, now that Um, yeah, I, I think that just raises a different issue from the issue whether uh, the thing at the bottom of the list is the same, it consists of one string or, or, or two. Uh, uh, it is plain that there are the same number of uh, strokes there and the, uh, you could appeal to one-to-one -one correspondence to make sense of that. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think that answers the question whether uh, no, whether they're the same, uh, whether it's uh, one string or two. Uh, um, uh, take it as an analogy. Suppose you had a compound word that uh, so to speak, was sometimes printed as one word uh, and sometimes printed as two words. Um, for example, uh, the telephone company that serves New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, which I have some um, get service from, actually, is called Fairpoint Communications. Well, is that word fair point? Or is it fair point? The company itself uh, fudges the issue by uh, <laughs> uh, by printing it. Uh, this way. Uh, I didn't do it quite right, but she put no space. In other words, they capitalize the word point. So the result is that you have a kind of perceptual ambiguity when, according to one uh, convention about spelling, it's two words, and according to another convention, it's just one. Um, That's a case of ambiguity rather than vagueness, I would, I would say. So it's rather different from the ones that... Uh, uh, but you could imagine vagueness where there was a just much less than the conventional one-letter space between the two. Uh, and, 
then I think the way you usually answer, answer it would be to make a judgment about the intentions of whoever wrote it as to whether it was intended to be one word or two. Uh, This practice, by the way, is one I don't much approve of. I don't, don't like companies for business, for business purposes messing with very basic conventions of written language. Thank you very much.